I'm delighted to be here. Brandon really speaks highly of you. He says you're an elite group. And so to have an opportunity to share some ideas with you is a real honor for me. And I told Brandon, as you heard, I'd be pleased to come down and speak. And then he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't pay you anything. And I said, well, no, I won't charge you at all. They said, well, but you still have to give a good talk. So, I promised Brandon I would come down here today and be good for nothing. I know you guys are busy, you have your own agenda. But I've given a lot of thought. I started asking the question when I started off, as Brandon did, as you have. Why are some people more successful than others? Why is it that some people accomplish wonderful things with their lives, and the great majority of people don't? They all start off sort of at the same starting line. During the course of the years, some people get way ahead and most people stay in the middle, and others get so far behind they think they're first. So, I've studied it for years and years and years. And in the last few years, there's been this idea, the secret, the law of attraction. If anybody read the secret, heard the law of attraction. And that kind of irritated me for a couple of reasons. First of all, the person who wrote The Secret, Rhonda Byrne, took my course on the psychology of achievement in New Zealand many, many years ago where I taught not only that law, but a whole series of other laws. The second thing is that there's a thing in statistics that says that something may be necessary but not sufficient. In other words, the law of attraction, thinking positively, is necessary but it's not sufficient. And unfortunately, in the entire work on the secret, the word work does not appear. And that's the great problem. So many people are misled. There's an enormous number of people who think it's easy to become successful, as if you just have to find a gimmick or a trick or some clever way to overcome all of your sloth and laziness and jump ahead years and years. But you find, we find that it's simply not true. There's a principle that I learned many years ago, and it was the principle of willingness. And it basically said that successful people are willing to pay the price of success in advance, and unsuccessful people aren't. And the price is usually very, very high. You have to go to deliberate extremes for a long time. You'll find that I worked with Bill Danko who wrote The Millionaire Next Door, with Thomas Stanley, and they interviewed thousands of self-made millionaires, and they said, how did you coming from sometimes very humble beginnings, limited education, manage to become wealthy in one working generation? And they said the same thing. They said, well, I didn't have great intelligence, I didn't have a great education, I didn't have a great family, but I was willing to work harder than anyone else. And that was the key. They were willing to work harder, start earlier, work harder, stay later, and so on. So, as I began to study success, I want to start off and tell you a quick story because we're going through one of the most turbulent economies in all of human history. In all of our history, and I've been through several ups and downs, we have a recession or a depression or a collapse or a problem in the economy about every 10 years, and we're into this one. We had one in 2000, 2001, we had one in 1990, 1991, we had one in 1980, 81, 82, and we're having that one now. This one is worse, and this one is worse, because there's sort of a cumulative effect. There are too many people, 60% of Americans now take more from government than they put in, which means that 60% of Americans are basically living, to one great degree or another, as parasites. And the other 40% have to work and pay all the bills and produce everything. And the only way to get the money for the non-producers is to tax people. And when you tax people, what happens is the resources they have to invest decreases, and so they can't create jobs. So, this entire, I'm not going to talk about politics, but this entire stimulus program, 100% of it went to government servants. Nobody got it except for, it was to hire and to pay more government servants. And government servants, as you know, there are too many of them. You know, the problem with politics is the word politics. Poly means many, and ticks means voracious bloodsuckers. But anyway, Bernard Baruch, about 1903, Bernard Baruch started off, 15 years old. He was a runner on Wall Street, and he would run buy and sell orders from one broker to another. They didn't have telecommunications or telephones at that time. He was a young guy, and he would run, and he got paid about three seventy-five a week. Instead of just running back and forth, he would ask people, why are you selling? Because every time somebody sold, someone else was buying, and because somebody bought, someone was selling. So, it was a difference in judgment. The person who sold thought it was going to go down, and the person who bought thought it was going to go up. So he would ask them, 
Why did you buy? What is your reason for buying this stock? And then he would ask the person who was selling, What is your reason for selling? And he made notes. And then he tracked. He took the time, and he tracked to see what happened, and see which of these predictions turned out to be true. Over time, he developed a tremendous sense for what succeeds and what doesn't succeed. He began to trade on his own account. Jump ahead 30 years, and now he's one of the richest men in America. He's worth $600 million. He's been an advisor to six presidents, and he's one of the most esteemed financial minds. And the economy is going through a period of turbulence, and they came running to him. Mr. Baruch, Mr. Baruch, what is the economy going to do? And he said, Well, he said, when the economy is up for any period of time, eventually people come to believe the economy will always be up. When the economy is down for any period of time, people come to believe the economy will always be down. Both are wrong. The economy will fluctuate. I was reading an article from the Financial Times yesterday, and it talks about 10 of the most successful business people in the world. And I was reading one of the articles, and it says, Well, you fail over and over, but it's just one of the prices that you pay to be successful. One of the most esteemed business people, and I thought, isn't that interesting? Because failure is far more common than success. You're going to try far more things than will succeed. There's a man named David Foster. He's a musical impresario. He produces songs, and he's been producing songs going back to James Brown all the way through to Celine Dion. And if you want to make your mark in the musical world, if you can get him to represent you, it's very helpful because, over about 25 years, he's produced a hundred hit songs. And he was being interviewed recently, and I thought it was a fascinating interview. The interviewer, a friend of mine Hardy, said, You must be very proud of yourself. You have produced a hundred hit songs over the course of your career, and won 22 Grammys which makes him the number one guy. And he said, yes, he said, but you must appreciate, I produced a thousand songs to get a hundred hits. And we're talking about what I call the 10% factor, that if you could be absolutely guaranteed of failure nine times out of 10, but in return for being willing to endure that failure, you'd be guaranteed a great success one time out of 10, you could have a fabulous life. Now, if I told you, and sometimes there's a principle that says between you and great success, there's a number of failures that you have to endure. Now we don't know what the number is, but there's a number of failures you have to endure. And after that, you'll be extremely successful. And maybe it's 50, maybe it's 90, maybe it's 100. But as soon as you have covered the number between here and where you want to go, you're going to be a great success. So, if I could tell you this, and you believed it 100%, what would you do differently? What would you do? Oh, go out and fail as much as you can. Fail fast, learn quick, fail every single day. How many times can I fail today? And I have a little technique that I learned from a successful sales organization. They have a contest every day. Who can get rejected the most? And whoever gets rejected the most gets a prize. And so, people go out and they hit the pavement at 8 hour in the morning, and they run and they go and talk to people, and they keep track of how many rejections they get. At the end of the day, that is their claim to fame. How many rejections did you get? 19. I got 21. Hey, I got 23. I got 25. I beat you all, you thumbsuckers. And so, they make it a joke, and they get up in the morning. They laugh at the number of rejections they get, because it's the fear of rejection that holds us back more than anything else. If you didn't care, as a matter of fact, if you actually got rewarded for getting rejections, you'd be out there calling on people, opening doors, and contacting people all day long because you just wouldn't care. It's almost like there are some people that have a thing in their brain that switches off certain feelings or switches off certain emotions. Imagine if you had no fear of failure, no fear of rejection. Then you just talk to people all day long, and every time you talk to people, you get smarter, you learn something, you get feedback. You get information which puts you closer and closer. But here's my promise. There are a certain number of failures which you must endure before you achieve extraordinary success. But we don't know what the number is, so just get on with it, right? Just get on. If a person says, I'm only going to fail once a year because I'm going to play it real close, well, you're not going to live long enough to succeed. But a person who's succeeding several times a day is putting himself on the fast track. Anyway, so I was looking at this secret and this law of attraction, and I think one of the greatest weaknesses that we have in our world is people are trying to be successful on the cheap. 
They think that there's some gimmick that will enable them to be successful without working. So, I studied success. And I realized that success is not a matter of the law of attraction. It's not a matter of luck. It's not a matter of being in the right place at the right time. Success is more a matter of probabilities. And this was my great breakthrough when I didn't graduate from high school. But in my 30s, I went back and got an MBA degree. And one of the courses was probability theory. Has anybody here ever taken probability theory? Terrible course. I mean, you're so happy it's over. But you learn in probability theory something that lasts you for the rest of your life. And what you learn is that there is a probability that everything can happen, and that these probabilities can be calculated, and that they can be influenced. So, I want to talk to you a little bit about probabilities, and how you can influence probabilities. Because by influencing probabilities, you can dramatically increase the likelihood that you will be a success much faster than other people. There's a principle called the winning edge principle. And the winning edge principle says that people who succeed have the winning edge, which means sometimes they're just a little tiny bit better, or they're doing things just a little bit differently in one particular area, and it leads to an extraordinary difference in results. There's a principle that says if a horse runs in a horse race and wins by a nose, it wins ten times the prize money of a horse that comes in second by a nose. Now does this mean that the horse that came in first by a nose is ten times faster or twice as fast or fifty percent faster? No. It's just a nose faster. People who succeed in life are a nose better. They're a nose ahead of people who don't even appear in the rankings. If you look at the Olympics that are going on in Vancouver right now, the people who come in first place will be remembered. The people in second place will be remembered by a few people. The people in third place will be quickly forgotten, and nobody else will be remembered at all. But it's always the person who wins by a nose. Do you see that competition where somebody won by 33 of a second? It was like, was it Lid, who won by like a third of a second, or a third, 0.33 of a point, and that makes him the number one in the world. It's fascinating. Anyway, though in military terms, and I've studied military strategy for many years, there's a principle called a force multiplier. Now a force multiplier is what enables a small force to defeat a larger force, and force multipliers are studied in all the military schools. Some of them you're familiar with. One is speed. A military force that can move and hit quickly can often have an advantage over a more cumbersome or lower moving force. Another is intelligence, which means that they simply know more about the enemy's dispositions and they can take advantage of it. Another is concentration. Concentration of force is a key force multiplier. Many of the great battles where small forces have defeated large forces are the result of moving quickly and concentrating all of your forces in a key point of vulnerability. Well, these force multipliers are the same things that increase the probabilities in our lives. So, I just want to give them to you quickly, and I want to give them to you as what we call thought starters. These are things that just trigger your thoughts. So, the number one force multiplier is knowledge. Knowledge means that you have specialized knowledge that you can use to achieve a particular goal. And knowledge in the 21st century is really the key to the future. And knowledge is becoming obsolete at a more rapid rate today than ever before. So therefore, you must be continually replenishing your knowledge, or you're actually falling further behind. Pat Riley, the basketball coach, used to say, If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And in terms of knowledge, if you're not continually upgrading your knowledge, the knowledge that you have is becoming useless over time. They did a study. I had dinner with a gentleman named Gary Becker about two years ago in Chicago, and he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. And he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, and he said, we don't have an income gap in America today. It's important to understand because the income gap is the big political thing. What we have is a skills gap. He said, it's like in a marketplace. You go into the marketplace or like an auction and people with really good skills are being bid up. People want you, I'll hire you. And people with average skills or mediocre skills are just not really in demand. It's nobody demanding them. And what they find is that people in the bottom 80% their average income goes up at about 3% a year, which is pretty much the rate of increase of inflation and cost of living. If they're employed, they're not employed. People in the top 20%, their income goes up between 11 and 25% a year. Now, if your income goes up at 25% a year, you'll double your income every two years and seven months because of compounding. So you'll find that there are people on the low road who are just basically getting by. And then there are people who are constantly upgrading their knowledge.
and sometimes it's only one piece of knowledge that can make all the difference in the world. But with regard to probabilities, we never know what the knowledge is. We never know whether it's going to be this. Well, I picked it up in a magazine. I learned from Brendan. I came here. I read a book. I listened to a program. So, what you have to do is you have to be increasing the amount of knowledge that you're taking in. I use kind of like the Pac-Man model. You're going to chop, chop, chop. You've got to be gobbling information all the time, because you never know which piece of information will be the critical piece. I'll give you an example that I'm kind of happy with. I was invited to speak to a large conference, had about a thousand people. And it was all on different ways to run your business better, be more effective financially. People would come from all over the country to attend this conference, and it was in a big hotel in Atlanta. And I arrived there, and I was speaking the next morning. The person who spoke in the evening, who was kicking off the conference, was a guy named Charles. Charles Ruff. Ruff Times. Do you remember that? Well, this guy, Howard Ruff. Howard Ruff, right? Sorry, thank you. Well, this guy got up, and he was supposed to kick off this conference, and he's supposed to be a financial expert and so on. Basically, for 90 minutes, he told everybody in the audience how terrible the financial world was, that there was no hope, that you should be turning your money into gold and canned foods, burying it in your backyard, hunkering down in your basement, getting ready for riots in the streets when nobody had any food. I mean, he literally gave the most depressing talk that you could possibly imagine for an entire thousand people, who come from all over the country to learn how to be more successful. And, uh, I got there that night, I met my clients, and they all had this glum look on their face, and I said, what happened? He says, well this guy just ruined the whole spirit of this thing. I mean he started it off talking about all. And you know they say, figures lie and liars figure, and you can use statistics to prove anything. So he had all of these statistics. However, I've been reading Fortune Forbes magazine on the plane on the way down. And in Forbes, there was an article on the credibility of various newsletter writers and financial predictors. And it turned out that of 600 that they looked at, turned out that Howard Ruff was the worst, 100% worst predictor of economic events in the history of writing newsletters. Is that he had never been right once in his whole life. As a matter of fact, they said if you had just done the opposite of anything he suggested, you would have been financially successful. So they said, because there anything that you can say tomorrow when you speak to these people, because everybody's down, they're wondering why they came in the first place, and our revenue news are totally dependent upon sales and everything else. So I got up and I said, well, I understand that you had some interesting news from Mr. Howard Ruff yesterday. I said, well, here's Forbes magazine. Here's what Forbes magazine says about this guy. And I read it, and the whole audience gave me a standing ovation. I said, everything he says is wrong. Anything he told you is completely false. Anybody who listens to him is an idiot. The man has never been right once in his life. And they all cheered. And everybody was up again. And I thought about that afterwards. If I hadn't been reading, I read for about three hours, reading all different articles and magazines. I hadn't come across that because I didn't even know that Howard Ruff was speaking. But I just thought it was an interesting article. That one piece of information transformed that entire three-day conference. But you never know which one it's going to be. So you have to be gobbling it up all the time. So here's a good question for you. What one piece of knowledge would be most helpful to you in your career? What particular type of knowledge would it be? Marketing? Would it be sales? Would it be time management? Because you can't become good at everything, so you've got to pick your shots. You know, like the sniper, they say, one shot, one kill. What I have found is, you don't try to learn a whole bunch of things. What you do is you say, what is the most valuable piece of knowledge or knowledge area that I need to upgrade my skills in? And whatever it is, you take that one subject and you major in that subject. You just, you say, all right, for the next month, three months, year, I'm going to major in that subject. I would say, for us, and it never changes, but for us, it's probably marketing. Marketing and sales are probably the most important things we do, because you can have the best product in the whole world, but if you can't tell people about it in a variety of different forms, including personally, then it doesn't do any good. And there are many products and services out there that are mediocre, but they're damn, they're well marketed. I mean, the story that they tell is really good. So, knowledge is the first force multiplier, and whatever knowledge you have, it's becoming obsolete. It's like a water level in a leaky bathtub. It's going down, so you have to keep replenishing it. 
There's that little line from Alice in Wonderland where there's the rabbit going, I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. And Alice says, Why do you run so much all the time? Why don't you relax? And he said, No, you have to run this fast just to stay in place. If you want to get ahead, you have to run twice as fast. And it's the same thing with our life today. Because of the way the world is, we have to run twice as fast just to stay even, especially, or to make any progress. Now here's the second force multiplier, the second factor that increases your probability, and it's skill. Now knowledge, properly learned and practiced, turns into a skill. And today, our skills are mental skills. We don't learn physical skills, we learn mental skills. And mental skills are ways of thinking and acting and making decisions and getting results. The critical factor in knowledge and skills is always results. It's always results. Now here's what we know, and it's important to point this out, is that if you want to be successful, you have to be in the top 10% in your field. You have to be in the top 10%. You know, there used to be the story about Willie Sutton, the bank robber, and, uh, he was the most wanted in the FBI list. They finally captured him in the Midwest, tried him, convicted him, sent him to jail for life, and the reporters were covering the trial, and they asked him, Mr. Sutton, Mr. Sutton, why do you rob banks? You remember this story? And what did he say? Why did he rob banks? Because that's where the money is, yeah. Now why do you want to be in the top 10% in your field? Because that's where the money is, yeah. There's no money down there. There's no money in the bottom 80%. The money is in the top 10 or 20%. That's where all the money is. And sometimes people don't realize it. That you're only a very, very small distance away from being in the top 10 or 20% where all the money is. And so therefore, you have to ask yourself, and this is a question we put people through in our seminars. Imagine you could wave a magic wand. I brought my magic wand here today. Imagine you could wave a magic wand and be absolutely excellent in any one skill. What one skill would help you the most to double your income? What one skill would help you the most to double your income? And you're not very comfortable with something you don't really like doing that much. Something you'd prefer somebody else would do. You prefer to hire somebody to do it. But the fact is, there are certain skills that you absolutely have to have if you want to be able to use all your other skills. Now here's a discovery. And the discovery is that your weakest key skill sets the height of your income. Your weakest key skill. There's never more than five to seven key skills in any field. And your weakest key skill in your field sets the height of your income. So you can actually make more progress while coming up in that area, the weakest area, than you can in anything else. So, why is it that people are uncomfortable when they can identify the skill? They usually know what it is, by the way. If you don't know the most important skill, if you don't know your weakest skill, you've got to find out, because it's like a ball and chain. It's holding you back. You don't even know. You'd be working really hard on the outside, but that weak skill is holding you back all the time. Now here's an important point. The reason people are unhappy or tense about this skill is because they're not good at it yet. They're not good at it yet. Sometimes I ask, can anybody here drive a car? Say, yes. Ride a bicycle? Sure. Use a keyboard? Modern cell phone? If you can do any of those, in terms of order of complexity, you can learn any business skill. And that's what Brandon and I teach all the time. You can learn any business skill, because everyone who knows them didn't know them at one time. Everybody's in the top 10% today started where? In the bottom 10%. Everybody starts at the bottom. Everybody starts at the bottom. Nobody starts in the middle. Nobody starts up. They all start at the bottom, and then they work their way up. So therefore, if hundreds of thousands or millions of people can learn a skill, so can you. Now some people will learn it faster, and some people will learn it slower, but everybody will learn it. I used to say to my sales audiences, I'd say, the key to success in life is to look upon life like a smorgasbord or a buffet. If you want to get to the front of the buffet line, where all the good foods are, do you notice that when they make a buffet line, all the prime rib and the shrimp and crab are at the front? What's at the back of the line? Salad, filler, breads, pastas, rice, anything else. Because they want you as a dumb consumer to fill your plate with crud that doesn't cost anything. But by the time you get to the front of the line, you have no room left for the good stuff. So, I say, if you want to get to the front of the line of life, then the first thing you do is step one. Get in line. Get in line. That's right, which is a real shock to people. 
they sit there, and it's always, ready, 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 aim, 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 but never fire, and they talk about what they're going to do. I love the line from Henry Ford, where he said, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do, you can only build a reputation on what you've done. So the first step is to get in line. Now some people will go through the line faster, some slower. But step number two, if you want to get to the front of the line, is what? Wait in line, stay in line, stay in line, get in line, and stay in line. Now how do you move forward through the line? Well there's only one way. It's knowledge and skill, and knowledge and skill, and knowledge and skill. Every time you develop a new piece of knowledge or skill that will help you to get results that people will pay you for, you move ahead in line. Stop learning, stop moving, and people start to go past you. If you start learning again, you start to move ahead. If you stop learning, you stop moving through the line. So, the rule is, get in line, stay in line, and just keep learning the knowledge and skills that can help you the most. And you just keep moving through the line, and everybody who gets in line and stays in line, gets to the front of the line. There's no exceptions. It's like a buffet. Do you ever hear somebody in the buffet say, I'm sorry you cannot go forward? Yes, you can go ahead, but you will have to stay out. No. Everybody who gets in line stays in line gets to the front of the line. In other words, everybody who wants to get to the top 10% gets to the top 10%. Just get in line and stay in line. And remember this. And this was a shocker for me because I got such bad grades in school. Nobody's better than you and nobody's smarter than you. Nobody's better than you, nobody's smarter than you. You have more brain power than you could use in a hundred lifetimes. Don't ever, ever, no matter what you got in grades in school, no matter how hard it's been for you to learn a subject, ever, ever, allow yourself to think that other people are smarter than you. How many times have you met somebody who doesn't seem to have anything going for them who's doing well? There's nothing that will make you matter than to see somebody who's dumber than you, who's making more money than you. Have you had that experience? How could this nitwit be making so much money? It's not because they're smarter, it's just because they got in line and they stayed in line. Now the problem is that most people get in line say, boy, this line's going slow. I think I'll go and get in another line. Maybe I'll go and sit down. Or maybe I'll go back in the line again. And instead of getting in line and staying in line until they get to the top of their field, what they do is they just keep going around in circles. So, it's really important with knowledge and skill. Make a decision to get to be into the top 10%. And the way you do that is you just get in line, stay in line, just keep moving. Knowledge and skill. I sometimes say that it's like the ladder of success. And the ladder of success, if you can imagine your left hand and your left foot. Right hand, right foot, left hand, and left foot, is knowledge. Right hand skill, knowledge and skill. As you learn and apply, learn and apply, you move up the ladder. Stop moving, stop learning and applying, you stop moving up the ladder. Start learning and applying again, you start to move ahead. It's so astonishing, you know. Sometimes a person will go for years in a job and the company will go broke, they'll lose their job, and they're sitting there and say, well, I've got to get into something else. And they'll start learning and studying again, learning and growing, and suddenly their whole life takes off. So, at any given time, we can do that. And I don't need to tell you this. It's like singing to the choir because you're here. I mean, you're the ones who are here. So, here's the third factor I know Brandon was talking about. Contacts. Now contacts are another thing that increases your probabilities of success. By the way, if you're really good at what you do, every door opens for you. Now contacts are another thing, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship here. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of people you know and the number of people who know you in a positive way and how fast you move through the line of life. Everything in life, every turn in your life, comes with somebody standing there who opens the door, gives you a piece of advice, helps you out, hires you, buys something from you, introduces you to someone else. But we never know who one it's going to be. So, the key is, as Brandon teaches, is networking. You've got to keep in contact you've got to contact more people. Now sometimes people will not be receptive to you. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. It just means they're busy. It's not personal. You must never take rejection or lack of interest personally. It's just people are busy. They're preoccupied. They've got a lot going on. They may be on the verge of bankruptcy. Their boss may have just shouted at them. 
Their wife may be divorcing them. When you call them up, they don't want to talk to you. Well, it's not you. It's not personal. They don't even know who you are. So, if people are not receptive to you, that's fine. Remember the old saying, some will, some won't. So what? Next. Just keep on moving. So, contacts are really important, and networking is one of the most important things we do in our world today. Because it's always the number of people you know, and the number of who know you, that increases the probabilities that you'll meet the right person, or know the right person at the right time to achieve your goal. I had this interesting experience. I was speaking in Atlanta, and there's this very nice guy. I have problems with my ankles because I've been standing on my feet for so long, and so I've got pains. And he's an ex-football player, and he's also a speaker. I never met him before. His name is Brian Holloway. We started talking, and he was speaking before I was, getting very late, so I missed his talk. But he was leaving the next morning after his talk. By the time I got there, he had decided to stay for the day so he could hear my talk, which is a great compliment. And we were talking away, and he brought me some tablets because he was an ex-football player, and he'd been through tremendous trauma if you like, and he had aches and pains all over the place. He brought me some naturopathic pills that he'd gotten from a doctor that take away the inflammation in your joints and remove the pain, so it was really helpful to me. Anyway, though we're talking away, and he's just a really nice guy, he's just being helpful and everything else. And I said, so what are you doing right now? He said, well, his biggest preoccupation is this piece of land. He used to play for the Boston Patriots, and he and some other people had bought a major piece of land and they're going to build sort of out in the country homesteads for football fans. They would each have their own homes and homesteads, and they would sell it to other people who were big football fans, so everybody out there would be either ex-players or coaches or any. But, you know, it's such a big deal, because he's a football player. Big guy. Football doesn't know very much about, he said. I said, well, you know, I have a friend just... I have a friend who's done a lot of real estate development of parcels, and he moved to Florida some years ago. Let me see if I've got his number in my briefcase, and he may be able to give you some advice. So, I went in my briefcase, I found his number, I called. He's very hard to get through. He's a very wealthy man. And so, I told his secretary, it's me. And I said, well, if it's you, because they know me, he gave me his personal number. I called him, and I said, Harry, I said, I got a friend here. His name is Brian Holloway, and he's got a piece of property outside of Boston, and he doesn't quite know how to develop it. He said, put him on the line. So, they began talking. It turns out that Harry Patton knows the property, knows the area very well. His son, Michael, who's also very successful and very wealthy, is actually developing in that area, has properties all around it. He said, they put the two of them together and transformed Brian Holloway's life. And it was afterwards you think, isn't that a great thing? You know, because it's just asking people and introducing people and opening a door here and... But you never know who it's going to be. So, to increase the probabilities, you have to meet lots of people. Now Brian has... Brandon has said this, and it's really important, is that there are two types of people in our world today. And there's one type of person who looks at other people in terms of, what can I get from this person? And they meet you, and they say... What can I get from this person? And they ask you, How are you? And how's everything going? Often they're very charming. What do you do? And what sort of work are you in? So, as soon as they determine that they can't get anything from you, they just turn around, walk away. It's... And there's a psychological term. I think it's... They look upon other people as agents that can get them something. And then there are other people, like yourselves, who look upon people in terms of, I wonder what I could do for this person. Because there are laws in the universe, not theories. Like the law of probability is a law. The law of reciprocity is a law. It says the more that you put in, the more you get back out. And it's like planting seeds. When you plant a seed, you don't have to do anything. Nature grows the seed. So if you plant seeds, if you look for opportunities to help other people, then what will happen is, it'll always come back to you. It always comes back to you. And you don't have to worry. It may come back to you from the person you helped. It may come back to you like Brian Holloway helps me. I introduce him to Harry Patton, the father, who introduces him to Mike Patton, 
who lives in Boston and transforms his life and his family. And I could tell from the way he was talking that this was a real big thing for him financially. It was a major deal for him. And suddenly one contact. Why? Because he stayed over, because he wanted to watch me, and he wanted to help me with these homeopathic tablets he was thinking of giving. Now, it's just a wonderful example. He was only thinking of how he could help me. He had no idea, but I just happened to know through experience someone who could help him back. So, you never know what it's going to be. So, always look for ways to help people. Always look for a way to do something for them. And the best people that I know, and I've met people worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and at the end of a conversation, they say, Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for you? I first learned this when I was a young business person, sitting through a meeting with two billionaires, and just sitting there, as I was the assistant to one billionaire, his assistant was there, and these two were talking. We just sat quietly while they talked. They're talking about things that were over our heads. And then they asked me a couple. He was very gracious, and he turned to me at the end of this conversation. He said, Brian, is there anything I can do to help you, in front of my boss and everybody else? I said, No, I can't think of anything. But I was really kind of impressed. Wow. I mean this guy was hugely successful. And I learned later that over every time I talk to a really successful person, if you have a nice rapport, they say, is there anything I can do to help you? So, what you do is imagine that you're already rich. And when you talk to people, just say, is there anything I can do to help you? Anything I can do? And even in many cases they'll say no. But they'll remember that you offered. You didn't try to get something from them. You tried to do something for them. So, it's really important to build your contacts. And that's why good smart people come to meetings like this and talk to other people and introduce themselves to each other and ask them, what do you do? And how's it going? Is there anything I could do to help you in what you're doing? And what sometimes a person will just say, one idea or, I just read this, or, I just heard that. And it's a priceless piece of information. But it's of no value if you don't ask people or talk to people and look, just look for ways to give. I have a law which I began teaching many years ago, that Brandon knows. It's the more you give of yourself with no expectation of return, the more that you will get back from the most unexpected sources. So remember, nature says, just so, and nature will grow the crop. Right now, the fourth multiplier is money. Now money means that you have to have some money. Many years ago, when I was starting a business, when I started my first business, I joke, I learned how to sell again. I sold my house, I sold my car, I sold my furniture, I sold everything to feed my habit. But one of the things I found is that if you don't have any money, it has a distinct negative effect on you. You've heard of the law of attraction, which is true, but there's also the flip side of that. It's called the law of repulsion. Just like in attraction, there's what is called centrifugal force, where things spin outwards, and centripetal force, where things spin inwards. Well. The law of attraction says that if you have money, you attract to yourself opportunities to make more money. If you have no money, you drive away opportunities to make money. And the old saying, it takes money to make money, and so on. Then, what gets? When you know, the rich get richer, and the poor get children, you've heard that. The point is, that you... It was too quick for you, huh? Alright. The point is that you don't need a lot, but you do need some. And I'll tell you why. And it is, that it is not what you achieve in life that is important. It's what you become. And the discipline of saving is a discipline that has an effect on your character, and on your whole life. W. Clement Stone once said, If you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. If you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. And what he was basically saying is that you lack the character for success. Because it takes tremendous discipline and self-control not to spend. We live in the most wonderful consumer society in the world. There are so many neat things to buy and so much credit available. It takes tremendous discipline not to spend and to grow and to accumulate money. Many years ago, I had a mentor, and he said, Brian, the very first thing you do is get yourself a pool of money. And this is his words. He was a senior executive, and we can just rephrase that and call it freedom money. But in other words, a financial freedom account, where you have money so that you have a distance between you and poverty. And that's one of our goals of course is to acquire as much money as possible. 
But a person who has money in the bank is a totally different person in terms of their character and personality than a person who's broke. And 80% of Americans are broke. One of the reasons why we have this huge problem in our society today is most people have not saved any money. And so then when the money that they have saved drops in half as a result of the stock market, they're looking at over a cliff. They're looking at an abyss. It's a scary thing to be 60 or 65 and have no money because they just kept spending it, thinking it would come in. So your job is really to put some money aside. I had an experience many years ago. I started my business. I lost everything. I gave up everything. I was... And I finally sold my house. When I sold my house, I had $110,000 in equity from the sale of the house. I was a... A little bit more than that. And my wife came to me and she said, Brian, she said, I want to put this money in a separate bank account in my name so it doesn't even appear anywhere, and you will not be able to touch it. I said, really? She said, yes. Well, she was adamant, and you know there's a... What's the difference between a wife and a terrorist? Well, the difference is you can negotiate with a terrorist. Yeah, well, this was not... This was obviously non-negotiable. And I said, okay, honey. I agreed. She said, I just want this for my security. And I, she, we've only been married a couple of years and we're going through this financial turmoil. And she said, and we just had our first child. She said, I want to put this money in there. So she did. And the most amazing thing happened is we never ran out of money again. We never touched that money. And we never ran out of money again. Something always happened. And this is in the trough of a major recession. And their companies were laying off thousands of people. But because of that money, it was almost like the nuclear uranium in a nuclear reactor was sort of generating an energy, and it kept attracting more money. So the most wonderful thing that happens is if you start to save a little money, it has a little energy, and it starts to attract more money. If you keep throwing money into this account, sometimes one of the models is like a financial fortress, and you keep throwing money over the wall into the financial fortress so you can't get it out. Goes in one way. What happens is the energy source, the more money there is, the more it starts to attract more money and more opportunities. But it gives you a sense of calm because you're not in panic. You know what it's like. We all know what it's like to be in debt. And when you're in debt, you're just like a haunted person. It's all you think about. 80% of the population out there gets up in the morning and all they think about is debt. The fact that they don't have any money. The fact that they might lose their job. Many people feel so desperate that they resort to drastic measures, like taking their own lives when they lose their job because they're so far down and desperate. Therefore, one of the requirements, not just for the money, but for your own peace of mind, your character, your self-discipline. Remember, it's not what you achieve. It's the person you become by saving the money. It's really important to have money put aside. And if that requires sacrificing, if that requires selling your house and moving to a rented facility, I had an interesting story. I had an intern working in my company for two summers in a row, a lovely young woman named Lauren. About three or four years ago, in 2006 or 2007, I was sitting on a plane flying back, talking to a businessman who had a very successful business. It was obvious we were both flying first class, and it was obvious that he had a good business. I asked him if he had a new house in mind because the real estate market in San Diego was going crazy. He said, no, I don't believe these prices can last. So I sold my house and I'm renting. I can get just as good a house or better for the same amount renting than I could for mortgage payments, so I've just decided to rent. Here's a guy, a very wealthy guy who runs a company, he got 120 people working for him, sold his house and rented. And he turned out to be right. Everybody else was busy buying houses. He sold. You want to buy a house? Good, you can buy mine. And he sold. Then about six months later, I sent him something in the mail, and about six months later, I got a note. Would you have an opportunity for an intern? My daughter is going to college, and she's looking for a place to intern. I said, sure. So we hired her, and for two or three months, she did a wonderful job. And she came to work for nothing. But whenever we bring on an intern, the deal is they'll work for nothing just for the experience. After about a week, we decide whether we want to keep them or not. And if we decide to keep them, then we pay them. Because we know how important it is to them. She worked for us two summers, and in the course of working in our business and everything else, she decided what she wanted to do with her life. She wanted to be a professional copywriter, 
She wanted to get a degree in journalism. She wanted to work in advertising. She was ecstatic. She was so happy she'd finally decided what she wanted to do. Where did that come from? It came from sitting on the plane next to somebody who called me out. Anyway, so I'm getting off the track. But money is important. And it's important to put it away. Pick a number and say, I'm going to have this number, and I'm going to put it away, and not touch it. And then every time I have some spare cash, I'm going to put it into that account. And the more money that's in the account, the more magnetism that account has to attract more money. And you'll be quite astonished. Anybody who's ever done this is quite astonished at how this account starts to grow. And you do your investments and everything else, and you live your life separate from that. But this money is money. Just don't touch. Now number five is character. Now character, and by the way, the importance about money of course, is that it gives you opportunities. When an opportunity comes along, as Earl Nightingale said something that I listened to when I was very young, he said, if a person does not have any money, if an opportunity comes along and they can't take advantage of it, they will just look foolish. I never forgot that. I didn't want to look foolish. So if you have money, then you could take advantage of it. How many people say, I'd like to, but I don't have any money. I don't have any money. How long have you been working? 15 years in the most affluent country in the world, and you don't have any money? You don't have any money to buy anyway. So, character. Character is probably more important than anything else. And the most important part of character is integrity. Integrity means that you're a person of integrity, a person of honor, that you always keep your word. I have four children, and you can't teach children everything. They're all growing up now, but I've always taught them two things. Number one, accept responsibility, don't make excuses. And second of all, tell the truth. Accept responsibility, tell the truth. It's like those Roman galleys. Accept responsibility, tell the truth. If you ask my kids what advice their father gave them when they were growing up, they'd say, accept responsibility, tell the truth. If you asked my kids what advice their father gave them when they were growing up, they'd say, accept responsibility, tell the truth. And you know, those two have turned out to be fantastic because my kids, whenever they got into trouble, they'd say, I'm responsible. I'd say, then what did you learn? Well, this is what I learned, and this is what I'm going to do or not do next time. Great. I never got mad at my kids, and I never punished them for making mistakes and getting into trouble. I'd say, all good kids get into stuff. They get into stuff. If they're good kids, they try lots of stuff. And some of it doesn't work out. My wife and I read this little one-liner when our children were small. It said, Would you rather your children got into stuff? Or would you rather they just came home at night and sat and looked at a stick for three hours? No, I prefer they get out and get into trouble. My son David, when he was ten years old, he took some friends here to the country club around the corner from where we live. And they went into the men's locker room. They're not supposed to be in the men's locker room. They're in the men's locker room. And they got a container of liquid soap. And they took it out and poured it into the jacuzzi. Well, this stuff bubbled and bubbled. You think it would bubble? It just bubbled and bubbled. It just came up and frothed and went out all over the deck and everything else. I mean, it was... It really frothed a lot. The country club people came over. And then the security guards came over. And they called the police. And they all came. Here's David with his three friends, and they're all... And they called us. They said, Could you please come over here? We have a bit of a problem. Your son is in some trouble at the country club. It's just around the corner, so we went over there. The police were very nice. I mean the police were like parents. You know, professional parents. They understand, so they said, Well, you know, they've gotten into trouble, so go easy on them. I said, Okay. So I picked up my kids, and the other parents had to come and pick up their kids and took them home. A week later, we got a notice from the country club saying that our membership had been cancelled. We had been thrown out of the country club because of our son having put soap in the jacuzzi. So I said to David, when I picked him up, I still remember, he was really down. There were police everywhere, two or three police cruisers, lights, everything else. And I said to him, what happened? He said, well, we put the soap in. We had no idea it would froth that much. So I said, well, stuff happens. I said, when I was a kid, I got into stuff. You know, it happens. And that was it. Not a single word. And then a week later, 
we got this eviction notice, you know, cancellation. So I said to David, I said, David, you got us thrown out of the country club. He said, oh dad, I'm sorry. I said, well, lousy country club anyway, who cares? I never made a thing of it. Even today, we still laugh about that because I never once said, you accept responsibility, tell the truth. And if you do that, then you never get into any trouble. Does anybody here have children? I read this one-liner. Barbara and I read this one-liner when our kids were small, and it had a major impact on our whole life. It said, If your children do not tell you the truth, who has made them afraid to tell the truth? Well, if your children lie to you, who has made them afraid to tell the truth? So for the rest of our lives with our children, we always encourage them to tell the truth. Tell the truth. Be a person of character. Be a person of honor. Always tell the truth. And our children have grown up always telling the truth. They've had a couple of shaky times, you know, where they may be missed a little bit, but mostly they tell the truth. Now in business they say, what is the most powerful method of advertising ever discovered? Word of mouth. 85% of the success of a business is determined by word of mouth. And the Lev of the Harvard Business School said, the most valuable asset that a company has is its reputation. Its reputation is how it is known to its customers. In other words, what do customers say about the company and the products and services after they have been exposed to them? I just wrote a book called, Now, Build a Great Business. And the core of the book is a very simple principle that just sort of slapped me in the head like a big wet fish after 30 years of studying. And the answer is, what is the key to success in business? 90% of your success will be determined by having a great product or service. And that's the word great. It's a great product or service. Now how do you know if you have a great product or service? How do you know? People say, this is a great product. This is a great company. These are great people. In other words, the number of times or the percentage of times that your customers, having been exposed to your product or service, spontaneously say, this is a great product, determines your entire future. Now saying that, and the reason I say that is because there's a lot of people who think, well, I can get by selling a mediocre Me Too product. I just have to find a gimmick to get people to buy it and then duck and run. But every single successful business looks upon this customer as a customer for life, and they know that the first sale is only the beginning of the process, and how they treat the customer in the first sale, and how the customer responds determines whether or not the second sale takes place. And so I say, the rule for success in business is to get them to come to you first, rather than your competitors. Get them to come to you again because they were so happy with the first experience and get them to bring their friends. Come to you first. Come again. Bring their friends. And the critical thing is your reputation. You know, in the movie business, what they do is they spend... I just read this. They'll spend $50 million producing a movie and $50 million advertising to get people into the theaters the first week. Now what happens is that they can't spend $50 million for several weeks. So they've got to get people into the theater so that people watch the movie and begin to tell their friends. And it's only when a movie gets legs, they call it, gets legs, that people start to tell their friends, you've got to see that movie, that the movie starts to become successful. Why? Because of its reputation. Everything is reputation. Now, in your life and my life, your reputation is everything. Your character, your integrity, is the most important thing you have. And one of the decisions that you make, is you never compromise your integrity. You never say anything that's not true, and you never do anything that's not correct. No matter what the financial temptation, you're adamant. You're not going to compromise your integrity. Now here's the wonderful thing. In psychology, they say that your level of self-esteem, how much you like yourself and respect yourself, is largely determined by your self-image. And if your self-image is that of a person of character, every single time you behave with character, you do what is the right thing. You like yourself more, and you respect yourself more, and you feel happy inside. And you feel strong. You feel powerful. You have a strong handshake. Your self-confidence actually goes up. You have greater confidence when you're living in truth with yourself and others than anything else. So there's a real payoff. If ever you sacrifice your integrity for a short-term payoff, you lose two things. First of all, you never get the thing you sold your soul for. Look at Bernie Madoff and those people. He's got a 150-year prison sentence. That's not good. And the other thing is, it destroys your self-esteem. It just...
you don't like yourself very much. And the most important thing you can do is like yourself. So, character. Now number six is good work habits. Good work habits. Now all of these fall together. But in terms of increasing your probability of success, the fact that you work well and work hard and get a lot done, nothing can replace that. That means that you manage your time and you set priorities, and you concentrate on your highest value tasks, and you start earlier, you work harder, and you stay later. There's no replacement for that. The great problem with the bottom 80% of people, not just in America but worldwide, is that they're lazy. Lazier than bone lazy. One of the biggest problems we have in our society is lazy people are going to politicians who say, Luck, give me your vote, and I'll take the money away from the hard workers and give it to the people who aren't working at all. And there's an old rule that whoever promises to rob Peter to pay Paul is always going to have the support of Paul. And that is modern economics today. You elect me, and I'll rob Peter and give the money to you. And so, good work habits, being a hard worker, is one of the very best reputations you can develop. Everybody in every business knows who the hardest workers are. Number seven is image. Now this is really important. It means you look good on the outside. This is not a complicated thing, but human beings are extremely visual. And many people are hired for a job, or they get the sale, or they get the opportunity just because they look good. Just because they've taken the time to turn themselves out well. Now, in the last few years, there's been a slide towards dressing like a bum, looking like a bum, looking unkempt, looking like you fell off a watermelon truck and got run over by a car. And so people think it's cool. It's cool to look crummy. No, it's cool to look crummy as long as you have no hopes for the future. Because people who are successful, look successful. I've spoken to half a million to five million people now. And in every audience worldwide, when people come up and talk to me, I know who's successful. I say, I bet you're doing really well. They say, yes. How do you know? You look like it. Successful people look like it. They look like they're doing well because they've taken the time. Women are much better at this than men. Men have this idea that it's okay to dress like a bum. And nobody will mind. Well, no it's not. Because here's why. The way that we dress is a way of telling people who we are. This is who I am. This is the package. Okay? This is the package. So, if you dress like a bum, what you're saying is, this is who I am. I'm a bum. If you want to entrust me with your money, then you deserve everything you're going to get, and it's not going to be much. So therefore, because you are in complete control of your dress and grooming, how you dress and groom is a statement to the world about the person you are inside. And there's a rule that says, if it doesn't help, it hurts. Everything counts. So, just a matter if... Look at the most successful people in your business or industry, and look at how they turn themselves out, and then just do the same thing. Just pattern yourself after the most successful people, especially if you're talking to clients and customers. Really important. By the way, interesting thing. If, let's say you're working on the internet and you're doing all your business on the internet, you say, well, nobody can see me. Okay, do you know that if you get up in the morning and you dress properly, I'm not saying you wear a tuxedo or a formal dress, but you get up in the morning and you groom and you dress properly, exactly as if you're going to an important business appointment, people can hear it in your voice when you talk to them on the phone. It actually comes through in your communication because there's something sort of electrical about the fact that you look good. The BBC is very famous for its BBC broadcasters. They speak perfectly correct, high-level English. BBC broadcasters are required to dress in evening tuxedos, in order to read the news on the radio. And yes, and they've done this for decades. And people listening to the BBC, one of the most respected news broadcasting organizations, can feel that the person reading the news on the radio is dressed well. Just interesting. Number eight is creativity. And creativity, we find there's a direct relationship between how creative you are and how successful you are. By the way, going back to image, one person that you meet at one time who you make a positive impression on can change the rest of your life, can change your whole career, can open a door for you, can transform your career. But the rule is, you can't afford to close that door just because you didn't bother. With regard to creativity, there's a direct relationship between the number of ideas that you come up with to improve your life and how successful you'll be. So, successful people are always looking for different things, 
for different ideas. How we can do it better, faster, cheaper, more conveniently. How can we help our customers? And so on. So they're constantly looking for better ways. And there's a relationship between the quantity of ideas and the quality. Do you know that 99% of business ideas don't work? Do you know that? It's a real shock. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? Try this, try that, try this, try that, try this, try that, and nothing seems to work. And then you start to think, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with my product or service. No, you just have to try a lot of things. And eventually, if you do it right, you'll eventually find the way that works. But you have to have lots and lots of ideas. Number nine is a positive mental attitude. Obviously, a positive mental attitude means that you are a generally positive person. You're cheerful. Do you know what the number one word used to describe the most successful people in sales or business is? Number one word, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a store, whether it's a salesperson, a business owner. You know what the number one word is? Rhymes with spice and rice. Nice. He or she's a nice person. Why do you go to that place? Well, they're nice people. Why do you go to buy from them? Well, they're nice people. What percentage of people's decision making is emotional? What part is rational? About 85-90% is emotional. It's 100% emotional. Human beings are 100% emotional, and they're inordinately affected by the way they're treated by other people. People are like moths to a flame. They're attracted to positive people, people who are friendly, people who are cheerful. One of the most important things you can do is never criticize. Never criticize. Look for the good in every situation, but never criticize other people. Never criticize your competitors. Never criticize anybody. You know, there's that song from Texas where, never is heard a discouraging word. Frank Sinatra used to say, if you can't say something nice, don't speak at all, is my advice. And so, just make a resolution never to say anything negative about anybody. Even if your prospective customer hates your competition and you hate your competition. Never say anything. It's so easy to slip into complaining, criticizing, whining, and moaning. Always be cheerful, even if your whole life is going to hell in a handbasket. Keep smiling. People like to deal with people who are happy and who are positive. And sometimes, just the fact that you're a nice person can give you an edge. If the differences between your products and your competitors' products are very small, just bending over backwards to be nice can give you an edge. And then, I'll give you number 10. The reason I do this is because I have to be in the North County at 3.30, and it's half an hour. Number 10 is luck. Now I said that luck didn't count, and the answer is luck doesn't. But what happens is, that if you're constantly gaining knowledge and learning all kinds of things that can help you, if you're developing your skills and getting better and better, if you increase the number of contacts you have, if you have money in the bank so you can take advantage of opportunities, if you have the kind of character that causes people to admire, respect you, and open doors for you, if you have good work habits so you get a lot done in a short period of time, if you have a great image so that people admire and respect you, if you're coming up with ideas all the time, and if you're a cheerful person, you're going to have what is called luck. And people are going to say, geez, you sure are lucky. That's what happens. Whenever a person's successful, they say, boy, you sure are lucky. Well, they didn't realize that luck was simply a matter of hundreds of little things. All great successes are the result of hundreds of little efforts that nobody ever sees or appreciates. What they do is they just keep doing these things. So, I wanted to leave you with three key points. Point number one is that today we have a need for speed. You've got to move fast, because there's no time at all for people to just coast. There's only one direction in which you can coast, and that's downhill. So, if you get a good idea from Brandon, move quickly on it. Move fast. Try it out. Know that it won't work in most cases. Try it out. Try something else. Try something else. Try something else. Collect rejections and failures. See how many times you can fail on the road to success. Recognizing that you are a learning organism, and just like a cybernetic organism, every time you do something, you get feedback. Which makes you smarter and gives you ideas. You try something, you get feedback, which makes you smarter, so you keep failing in a forward direction. And even though it's at an unconscious level, you're getting better and better, smarter and smarter, quicker and quicker, the more you fail. The second point is that the three most important words that will determine your financial well-being for the rest of your life are the words competition, competition, and competition. Admire your very best competitors, 
Always look for ways to do them one better. But remember that competition is so incredible that if you have something that works, tomorrow your competition will copy it. They'll steal it. And they'll try to do it one better. So, we can never rest. We're in a contest. We're like a treadmill. And the treadmill is going faster. We can never rest because your competition is as determined to get your customers as we are. And the last thing I wanted to leave you with, which is a little bit of an aside, has to do with what I call the number. This is really important, so I try to teach this to all my clients. In your business life, let's just say in business life, there is one number that more than any other number predicts your success or failure. There are dozens of numbers. I've calculated about 40 different numbers you can have in a business. From the number of sales to the size of sales, to the frequency of sales, to the return on income and investment, and so on. I don't know what it is for you, but every person has a number that one number is the most important number in their business. Some people say, well, it's the number of sales. Well, if it is, it may be that, but maybe it's not the number of sales. Do you know how restaurants calculate? It's the number of dinners that they serve. It's not the size of the dinner or what they have or what they eat or anything else. The averages work out. It's the number of settings. That's what they call it. Every night we had 276 settings on Saturday night. That's the number for them. They're always focused on how they can increase the number of settings. You must be clear about your number, because if you're not clear about your number, it's like driving across the country with no map and taking the wrong road and working on a different number. One company that I was working with, their number was the number of customers. That's what they were focused on. Getting more customers. More customers. More customers. And then we went in, and we looked at all their customers. Their sales for the last three years. We found that 90% of their sales, they had 10,000 customers. 90% of their sales came from 116 customers. And they had the whole company working on satisfying, servicing, mailing, emailing, contacting this huge customer base. 116 accounted for 90% of their revenues, and it just shocked them. And then they realized it was not the number of customers. What was it? The size of the customer. So, what they did is they took their top customers, and they analyzed them in depth, and they redoubled their efforts in customer service to those customers. And then they looked at what other companies and organizations had the same characteristics of the people, who were buying 90% of their products, and they went to work on that. They built a hundred million dollar business. They went from ten million dollars to a hundred million dollars by focusing on the size of the customer and getting more customers who had the capacity to buy more. So I just passed that on to you. What is your number? And I don't have an answer for you, but you need to think about it. Is it the number of sales, size of sales, cost of acquisition, profit per sale, frequency of purchase? What's your number? And whatever that number is, put everything aside, and like a laser beam, like those Star Wars, focus in on improving that number. And that alone can transform your life. If you had all of these things together and dramatically increase the probabilities of success, and then focus on that one number, well, you're all going to be rich and thin and famous and happy. Thank you very much. We're going to start this off a little differently today. I'm not going to begin with a funny anecdote or thought-provoking quote. Instead, I want you to feel this speech deep within you. Ready? Repeat after me. I am extraordinary. I'm capable of greatness. My friends, that is the mindset you must embrace to truly transform your life. You have unlimited potential within you, potential that is simply waiting to be unlocked. The seven habits we'll cover today are the keys to that profound interchange. But first, let me share a story with you. It's about a young man named Marcus, who felt stuck in a rut of mediocrity. Like many of you, he knew he was capable of more, but couldn't seem to break free from his limiting patterns and beliefs. Until one day, Marcus had an epiphany. He realized that his life wouldn't magically change through sheer willpower or wishful thinking alone. He needed to systematically alter his daily habits and routines, one small step at a time. What followed were seven seemingly insignificant adjustments that ultimately reshaped Marcus's entire trajectory. Little did he know, he was planting seeds that would blossom into an extraordinarily successful and fulfilling life. That's the power of small sustainable habits. Much like compound interest, their effects multiply exponentially over time. Consistency trumps intensity, and before you know it, your life looks entirely different. 
So, let's dive into those seven game-changing habits, shall we? Habit 1. Seek knowledge relentlessly. The more that you read, the more things you will know. In this age of infinite information, being a perpetual learner is utterly indispensable. The day you stop pursuing knowledge is the day you start dying. Nurture an insatiable curiosity about the world around you. Engage in conversations that challenge your beliefs. Let the hunger for growth consume you. Habit 2. Gel your priorities. If you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. You must be the architect of your destiny. Map out your day's highest impact activities each morning. Channel ruthless focus into mission-critical domains. Schedule them into concrete, immovable time blocks. Proactive energy management allows you to assert control over how you spend your most precious resource, your attention. Habit 3. Upgrade your peer circle. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. By strategically upgrading your peer circle, you'll experience immense upward mobility in your life. Spend more time with people who embody the qualities you wish to cultivate. Be fiercely discriminating about who you grant access to your realm. Habit 4. Cultivate an eternal mindset. It is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Start each new day with the visceral awareness that time is painfully finite. Develop an intensity to wring every last drop of richness out of each experience. Habit 5. Invest in your body. You are not just a mind encased in a body. You are an integrated athlete designed for boundless vitality and peak performance. Nourish yourself with whole, life-giving foods. Move your body through joyful exercise. Get abundant sleep, then learn to breathe fully. Habit 6. Practice gratitude profoundly. Cultivate the habit of being grateful for every good thing that comes to you. Take time each morning to journal at least three things you're profoundly grateful for. Living in a state of profound gratitude protects you from every form of misery and lack. Habit 7. Share your light generously. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Become a beacon of inspiration. Share your unique genius with the world. Give with unwavering generosity. Embed these habits into the very fabric of your being, and you'll experience the most precious gift imaginable. The gift of fulfilling your extraordinary potential. You are capable of greatness beyond what you can currently fathom. The only question is, what universe-denting work will you create with this wild and precious life? I hope the seven habits we've explored today have ignited an insatiable fire within you, a burning desire to fully awaken to your vast, unbounded potential, and start taking purposeful action to reshape your reality. Because honestly, there has never been a better time in human history to blaze your own trail as a luminous creator. The limiting beliefs that have shackled humanity's consciousness for millennia are finally dissolving. We're standing at a powerful inflection point where old paradigms of scarcity, separation, and powerlessness are giving way to new understandings of abundance, interconnectedness, and individual sovereignty. You get to be one of the architects of this new world, this unprecedented era of human flourishing. By living into these seven habits, you become a living embodiment of the transformative change we so desperately need. Just imagine the staggering ripple effects that could be unleashed simply by you committing to relentless growth. When you adopt a lifelong love of learning, you light an inextinguishable torch of wisdom within you. And that illumination cannot help but shine outward, inspiring everyone in your orbit to expand their own knowledge and capabilities. When you diligently schedule your highest priorities each day, you start achieving monumental feats that once seemed impossible. And those accomplishments radiate outward, becoming inspiring proof cases that propel others to surmount their own Everest. By continuously upgrading your peer circle, you foster rising tides that lift all ships. The communities and connections you craft become fonts of empowerment, elevating the potentials of everyone involved. With an eternal mindset grounding you in urgency and presence, you become acutely attuned to life's preciousness and that zestful aliveness becomes contagious, dissolving the inertia and complacency of those around you. As you honor your body's sacred wisdom, you generate resplendent vitality that flows into everything you create and influence. You become a living parable of what's possible when you fully integrate body, mind, and spirit. And when you steep yourself in profound gratitude, you exude an energetic field of abundance and fulfillment. This effortlessly uplifts others out of lack, 
instilling them with faith in life's inherent blessings. Finally, by sharing your genius and truth in all you do, you become a portal through which higher frequencies of consciousness can stream into our world. Your every act catalyzes a rippling expansion of humanity's collective awakening. Do you see the staggering implications of what could unfold if you fully embodied these seven habits? If you harness their incredible potency to become an architect of our new story as a species? Just a single individual fully committed to this path of radical transformation is powerful beyond measure. But gather enough beacons together, enough inspired souls shining their truth into our turbulent world, and anything is possible for us as a human family. We could make poverty, war, and economic injustice obsolete artifacts of our primitive past. We could revolutionize education, parenting, and healthcare to unlock thriving on scales we can scarcely fathom today. We could even reveal technological and consciousness breakthroughs that allow us to transcend the very boundaries of our finite physical forms. The future is ours to author, my friends, and it starts with you committing today, right here and right now, to relentlessly embodying these transformative habits. Because when enough people wake up and start living their truth with abandon, when enough people resolve to no longer be bystanders to their own destiny, that's when the most beautiful revolution of all takes place. The revolution of us all alchemizing our daily reality into a masterpiece of creative expression, unity, and boundless love. This is the magnitude of change you hold the power to spark today, simply by starting your journey as an impassioned architect of the more beautiful world your soul knows is possible. So let this speech be the spark that finally ignites that roaring blaze of determination within you. Let it be the catalyzing moment where you decide, once and for all, to stop playing small and limiting games with this precious gift of life. Because you, my invaluable friend, are solely qualified to be the sovereign of your own heroic journey. The heavens have conspired across eons to bestow upon you this radiant opportunity to show up as your most courageous, authentic, and fully blazing self. To unleash the awe-inspiring masterpiece you were born to create, and to help usher in a new dawn for our species. One where every single human can experience the glory of actualizing their divine brilliance. All you need to do is faithfully embrace and embody these seven simple habits, one day at a time. Let them be the winds that steer your ship toward the grandest version of your destiny and the loftiest vision of what's possible for us all. The path will not always be easy. There will be inevitable bouts of struggle and stormy seas to navigate. But always remember, you are extraordinary. You are capable of greatness beyond what you can currently fathom. And I, along with the limitless intelligences of this universe, are cheering you onward at every step of your journey. So go forth, you heroic light bearer. Go forth and change your life forever by breathing these habits into existence. Because when you do, when you rise up and step squarely into your greatness, that's when you finally experience the breathtaking, indescribable gift of becoming the author of your most extraordinarily heroic reality. A life of profound meaning, beauty, joy, and impact that reverberates across generations to come. A life that leaves this world forever transformed by the staggering gifts you offered it. A life where your luminous spirit shines as bright as the cosmos itself. That is the magnificent invitation before you, one only you can choose to accept by committing to embodying these habits daily. The grand journey awaits. All you must do is take that first courageous step into reclaiming your full unbounded power. Thank you, you radiant heroes, and may your path be blessed beyond comprehension.